Okay, so we're going to talk about angels today, and uh, and I want to I want to welcome my sister in laws. <laughs> thank you for coming. And my sister is not a guest; she comes quite often. But thank you all for coming this morning. I really appreciate it. And um, we're talking about angels. So this may not be something that we should, you know, that you think that we should be talking about. You may think that, well, you know, that's not a, a great topic, but. I realized this morning, just this morning, as God always seems to be talking to me on the day that I'm speaking, um, that uh, how how awesome uh, he is. He just made himself so big again um, in the light of who angels are. And, and sometimes we we have it reversed, maybe or we don't realize where um, the place for angels should be. They are beautiful beings. They are wonderful. And, and in, in, in the, uh, for the, today, you're going to find out that God has sent you many angels, not only divine angels, which, comes from, which come from heaven, but he sends you spiritual angels, uh, human, human angels. Uh, you know, he, he calls us, uh, those that are bringing the word of God to you, ministering angels. And we're going to read about it a little bit uh, this morning. And so um, we need to respect. We need to not blaspheme, um, which is to abuse the power that is given to the angels. We do not want to abuse it. We do not want to blaspheme it. We want to um, appreciate that they are there and that they are sent to us by your father in heaven, by God himself. He dispatches them. He anoints his people for you. If he gave me a message today, it's for you. It's not for me. It's for me and you together as the body of Christ. We are one. So it's not anything. That's how we can keep man in the rightful place and not idolize him or her. <laughs> we need to keep everybody in its right in their rightful place where we all belong. But we need to honor and we need to respect those that God has given us. It's really important. Uh, so the angels are dispatched by God to humanity, whether divinely or, or in human form. Okay, so to clarify the entire, that's why I like to call this book the word of God. Because when I say the Bible, it's more of a human natural book. And it, it, it is, it's a book in this world but it's written, it's, it's God himself, because he is the word. And he, he has put all the messages, all his conversation to us in this book, which is the word of God. And that's how I like to refer to it. So, so to clarify it, the entire word of God is exactly that, a word from God. That's why I always like to say the word of God, like I just said, the Bible, which makes it more like a book. We don't want it to be a book. We want it to be the spoken word. So I accidentally go to, and of course, nothing's by accident this morning while I'm going over all my notes and putting them in order. That's really what I all I was going to do. Well, God just gave me the whole message really um, this morning in Hebrews 1 and 2. Just read it again because you're going to want to read it again because it talks all about angels in 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 uh, hebrews 1 and 2 and I, I didn't even realize how much so god have so this is verse 1 in chapter 1 in hebrews god having spoken to the fathers long ago in the voices and writings of the prophets and we've spoke about this before how we are to appreciate what the prophets said because it was everything god told them to say for the people so so let's say it again god having spoken to the fathers long ago in the voices and writings of the prophets in many separate revelations each of which set forth a portion of the truth and in many ways has in these last days spoken with finality to us in the person of one who is by his character and nature, his son, namely Jesus. And remember when John in John, in the book of John, it says, um, God, Emmanuel, God with us. So G that was Jesus. Jesus was God with us. Verse three. 
The sun is the radiance and only expression of the glory of our awesome God, reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the light being, the brilliant light of the divine and the exact representation and perfect imprint of his father's essence and upholding and maintaining and propelling. I love this, this verse three, you gotta, you gotta read it in the amplified. It's crazy. It's, it's, uh, I love the description of Jesus. So it says up, he's up, upholding and maintaining and propelling all things, the entire physical and spiritual universe by his power word carrying the universe along to its predetermined goal. When he himself and no other had by offering himself on the cross as a sacrifice for sin, accomplished purification from sins and established our freedom from guilt, he sat down revealing his completed work at the right hand of the majesty on high, revealing his divine authority. So only him, I say all that to say only him, and it's always only him who has divine authority, none other, no angels, no, no, uh, no saints, no name above his name is above every name. Verse four, having become as much superior to angels. Okay. Verse four says, having become as much superior to angels, since he has inherited a more excellent and glorious name than they, that is son, the name above all names. For to which of the angels did the father ever say, you are my son? Today I have begotten, fathered you, established you as a son with kingly dignity. And again, did he ever say to the angels, and that came to me this morning, why did they, why did Paul have, feel like he had to say that? Why was he comparing the angels to Jesus? I wonder why. You're going to find out why in a minute. So he, um, sorry, where was I? So uh, for to which of the angels did he say, okay, you established you a son kindly. And again, did he ever say to the angels, I shall be a father to him and he shall be my son to a son to me. And when he again brings his firstborn highest ranking son into the world, he says, and all the angels of God are to worship him. The angels are to worship him. Um, if you want to see that, it's Psalm 97, 7. And concerning the angels, like the, the, this is the explicit wording in the word of God. And concerning the angels, he says, and he clarifies, who may, and he gave me all this this morning, who makes his angels winds and his ministering servants flames of fire to do his bidding. That's so clear, right? So he gives his angels, superior, the, the supernatural angels, wins. And his ministering servants, people who bring out the word of God or that meet you along the way, you're going to hear a song soon that's going to show you some beautiful angels. Um, I, I, I gave the version of the, um, of the song uh, where they show you some beautiful earthly angels that have helped humanity. So who make his angels wings and his ministry servants flames of fire. That's where you see the anointing on our life. You'll, you might say, well, is that Franca speaking? Or is that so-and-so speaking? And, or you see the anointing on somebody's life. And like I said before, and the Lord showed me, the anointing is not the man. <laughs> The anointing is the word of God in the man. And so when you see anyone shaking, or if you see anyone under the anointing of God, it's, it's, from, it's, it's from the word of God. That's where the anointing is lying right now. So, um, so who makes his angels win, it's definitely worth repeating. And his ministering servants flames of fire to do his bidding. That is so clear. So please read 8 to 12, uh, where in Hebrews chapter uh, 1, uh, you can read verses 8 to 12. 
uh, further to see some more, to read more. So therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. That's in verse three, by the way. Above your companions. That's what God gives you is the oil of gladness. You should have that. If you are serving the Lord and if you are in Christ Jesus and accepted him as your savior, you should have, you should have the oil of gladness. Verse 13, but to which of the angels has the father ever said, sit at my right hand together with me in royal dignity until I make your enemies a footstool for your, for your feet in triumphant conquest? Are not all the angels ministering spirits sent out by God to serve, accompany, and protect those who will inherit salvation? Of course, and the Bible, the word of God actually says, of course they are. <laughs> they are. They are ministering spirits that accompany and protect you at a time that you never knew could be possible. And I'm going to I'm going to we're going to share some stuff today um, of, of experiences and testimonies. I brought Sharon um, Letlow on today because she I was she, I was walking with her one morning and she shared um, a beautiful story about her angel encounter. And I'll bring her on in, in a few minutes. But there are, there are angels all around us. There is an angel for you there. And you're going to hear about it because it says their angel. Um, you're going to hear about it. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm excited. But we do have angels. They are real and they are here to protect you at your time of need. I called upon them twice in my life. Well, actually once for sure that I actually asked God to dispatch an angel for me. And uh, and then once I had a dream and, and I'm gonna share all three incidences with you in a, a, few, a few minutes. I just want you to hear a little bit more of this powerful word of God. Um, so chapter two, verse one, for this reason, that is because of God's final revelation in his son, Jesus, and because of Jesus's superiority to the angels, it says that we must pay much closer attention than ever to the things that we have heard so that we do not in any way drift away from truth. So we cannot drift away from truth. Now, this is the interesting part, verse two of chapter two. For if the message given through angels, the law given to Moses was authentic, it was not to angels that God subjected the inhabited world of the future when Christ reigns, after which we are speaking. So the, it says that the angels gave, gave the, the, the law to Moses. Because Jesus wasn't given. Jesus hadn't died for us yet. So angels must have been very important and very significant. And that's why I believe he had to explain the difference between Jesus and the angels in Hebrews. Uh, that made it quite clear when, when we read it, uh, verse 2. Because the uh, it says that it was the angel that brought the, 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 the word, the, the Ten Commandments, to Moses. So what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you are you graciously care for him? You have made him for a little while lower in status than the angels. So the angels are divine beings. So we are mankind. So they, so man was made lower in, in that sense than the angels. But not in, not that we can command the angels. We have no right to do that. We have no right to have them in our home like as statues. I, it's funny because everybody that meets me or that knows me always wants to give me an angel as a gift or something. So I, I sort of set it straight. I remember with my uh, superintendent, because he, he, I think we, we got into this discussion and I said, whatever you do, don't buy me a gift about oh, with the angels, please. Everybody always wants to give me a gift with angels on it or something. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this. I don't want to offend you. I'm telling you all this because it's truth. You cannot worship angels. You cannot have a statue about angels. It's not what God wanted. It's not what he intended. And it's subliminal. When you have it in your home, you do worship it in a sense. 
and you do make a bigger deal about it. So you've got to find your place with God, read these scriptures uh, on your own, make it your word, make it real to you. Because I know that God wanted me to bring this message out. At first, I didn't think it was such a, a powerful message as I did, as because I had a message, by the way, and God rewrote it for me this morning in Hebrews. <laughs> I had I had other other scriptures too, which I'm going to bring quickly. Um, so, verse uh, seven: You have made him a little lower than the angel in status than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. I don't want to go over my time, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, confirming his supremacy. Please understand that he is, he is the supreme. So uh, verse 9 says that Jesus was made lower than the angels for a little while by taking on the limitations of humanity. You know that Jesus was God with us, right? What Do you understand what a great thing God did for mankind? I want to be on my knees worshiping him. I want to be walking, worshiping him. I want to be work, uh, cooking, worshiping him. I can't tell him enough in the English language how I thank him because I would not be who I am today if it wasn't for him. I'm telling you, I would not be a good mother and a good wife at all if it wasn't for Jesus. Matthew 26, 53, do you think that I cannot appeal. This is Jesus. Um, I can't remember exactly where. I didn't read the whole chapter this morning. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will immediately provide me with more than 12? I don't know if he was on the cross actually at this. I think he was because it's Matthew 26, 53. So I think he was on the cross. Do you think that I, this is Jesus talking. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father notice he had to appeal to his father and he will immediately provide me with more than 12 legions of angels to help him get off that cross he could have he could have but he didn't even he didn't even ask he asked in the garden the night before if if it be possible take this cross from me but he, he didn't. He didn't when he was on the cross because he knew that he had to do it now at this point. He knew that he had to. He could have called angels. He could have asked God, but he didn't because he knew. Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16, I, Jesus, listen, I, Jesus, have sent my messenger, and in brackets, it's got angel, so it's either or. You got to respect the word of God from his messengers. You got to be thankful that there are people who are willing to spend time and read and read and read and, and, and teach the word of God. I appreciate anyone that does that. And so we do have to, but we can idolize them. So I, Jesus, have sent my messenger angel to you to witness and to give you assurance of these things for the church's assemblies. I am the root, the source, and the offspring of David, the radiant and brilliant morning star. Uh, Revelation 5.11, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the voice of the living creatures and the elders, and they numbered myriads of myriads of thousands of thousands. They're innumerable. We, you can call for, you can ask God to, to dispatch angels because there's so many. You can ask him. So I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to start with um, one of our testimonies. Um, Brother Bob, if you can, if you could put number one on, um, that would be great. This is a man, he's on the 700 Club, listen, and he's sharing about his experience with an angel. You hear people say it's like a train. It sounded like a train. It sounded like 40 trains. It was the largest tornado out.
break in U.S. history. Over a four-day period, the National Weather Service confirmed 358 twisters in 21 states, from New York to Texas. On April 27, 2011, delivery man Jimmy Jones found himself right in the middle of the chaos. It was F4. It's over 180 mile an hour wind. I was told, but uh, I, I, it, it got wider after it had just touched down, uh, probably a half a mile from from where I was at. It looked like it was 250, 300 yards from me when when I first saw it. Jimmy was driving his delivery truck down the interstate. He thought he only had one option to make it to an underpass. They say get in a ditch, but one of that magnitude, I wouldn't have never survived that. It was sucking things up out of the ground. But I felt led to go to that bridge, and I knew I had to get there. They tell you don't get under a bridge. That's the worst thing you can do, but when that's all you got. Once Jimmy made it to the underpass, the tornado was already on him. Jimmy remembers in the midst of the storm, he called out to God. I was praying that the Lord save me. I'd get out of the truck, jump over the guardrail, and start up that hill, and that hill is about as steep as these walls in this home. And me trying to run, and the wind's already hit me in the face and throwing things. I mean, it's debris coming at me. And uh, I mean, I'm digging, trying to get up that hill. And uh, I didn't think I was gonna make it. When he made it to the top of the underpass, someone was already there. When I got up under there, I see this fella sitting on this blanket. I was scared out of my mind. And I run up and got right in his face. I said, sir, we gotta take cover, this tornado. And he looked at me and he stood up and it was like everything slowed down at that point. He said, uh, is that right? And that's all he said. And he said, it, no concern. It was just like, what are you worried about? Deep within a crevice under the bridge, Jimmy grabbed a piece of metal pipe attached to the concrete. It felt like a piece of metal up in there, a metal rod that was further back up in there. And I just grabbed it. Debris pelted Jimmy's back. It felt like somebody stabbing you in the back with an ice pick. And then it tried, it had some draw to it. It tried to pull you out. But I was far enough back up in there, and I remember I was pulling hard into that V, and it, they were tied up against my shoulder. After what felt like an eternity, the wind finally ended. The man was still nearby. When it was all over with, and I come out from that little cubby hole that I was in, I remember looking and seeing him stand back up over there. I didn't see him get up under anything. I didn't see him crawl out from under things. It's just when I, I got down and looked over there, I seen him stand back up. Soon after the twister left, emergency personnel arrived on the scene. I saw my truck tore up. There were people screaming. Paramedics and, and, and police were there on the scene right I'm already. There was a lot of cars flipped upside down, tore up in the road and stuff. The paramedics were looking in the vehicles and they were asking where I was. And I, I, I heard him and I, I said, here I am. And I, I run down the embankment, stepped over. I said, I was, I'm up here with this fella. And I turned around and pointed and there wasn't nobody up there. There wasn't no blanket up there, wasn't no man up there. And the only way he could have come down was with me or beside me. He'd had to come down the same way I did because there was so much destruction on both sides of the embankment of that uh, overpass. And I asked people there, did y'all see another fella? No, no, we didn't see him. Well, well, he may have got. He may have got sucked up and turned. I said, no, he was there. I saw him. I know what I saw. He believes God sent him an angel to help him face the incredible force of that F4 tornado. A preacher friend of mine said that he believed that the Lord put him there to calm me. Jimmy says God taught him a few important lessons in the storm. God is and has been wonderful to me. He's a, he's a loving God. He's a caring God. He's my Lord and Savior. Here we need to be doing things for him because when it's all said and done, uh, nothing else is going to matter. Wow, that's real, right? It's, it's real. And I've had uh, similar experiences. I've had three. One um, that I remembered, actually, I, I kept reading um, online of some stuff. And uh, this other man, Jim Wikisa, says, An angels, angels are very real. Once I was on my way to morning prayer when a group of armed thugs surrounded us. Heaven opened and a very large angel descended to our rescue. The angel saved us. That was in 2019. Very real. Well, that reminds reminded me of a dream that I had the night before I was a Turner Fenton monitor walking the halls and these kids at Turner Fenton were very um, serious kids they were at risk students in the hallways that's who I was 
um, hobnobbing with every single day, swearing at me and all this. So I had a dream the night before, um, and I saw angels going, uh, coming down from heaven. I saw so many of them. And one angel broke rank and was coming towards me. And I did not know what it meant until the next day. I was walking at Turner Fenton and I was in charge of making sure they take off their hats and, and not wear any um, gang related stuff. And so I was very diligent and I saw these guys as my sons, which was a little dangerous because I, you know, I wasn't afraid of them. While well, this one boy, I caught three times, I caught him putting his, the third time, he, he uh, that I, I called him out um, on the taking off his hat, he picked up a chair to throw at me. And I hear somebody say, don't do it, man. And I know for sure <laughs> that there was an angel that held him back. So that was one of my, that was one story. But another one that I have is when I was in, a, it was dark, it was winter. Um, I was working at Loblaws downtown, Young and St. Clair. And I used to park my car about a block away in this, it almost looked like a uh, um, an empty building, but it had parking. Well, actually, I didn't even know, but I knew that it had parking, obviously, because I parked my car. So this man is standing beside me waiting with at this elevator and there's nobody around. It's dark. It's, you know, late at night, it's later at night. And I, I did not feel good to get in that elevator with that man. Did not feel it at all. And I thought, what am I doing? I said, if I leave, maybe he'll follow me. I, I, so I decided to go in the elevator and he starts, he looks at me, turns around and looks at me and says, are the first, uh, first of all, I'm praying. I'm asking God, I even, I even believe that I asked God for an angel. I can't remember 100%, but I'm definitely praying that God would protect me. And he looks at me like this and he says, are the first few floors of this building parking? Like, like very ominous, actually very much like that man <laughs> that was there. Like they don't talk much and I'm gonna share another little thing. Um, and, and, and he go, and I don't know, this man was not an angel. He, I think he wanted to, I don't know. I think an angel held him. And, and I said, yes, I believe so. And he goes, just like that. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, he's going to follow me. Please, please don't let him follow me. And anyway, long story short, he did not follow me and I'm alive today. <laughs> but the last one was the one where it reminded me of this story of how the angel just stood up and said, is that right? Is that so? Well, this is what happened to me. I was on a train going north in Italy. I was in Italy with Pastor Dell. She was in, the, in a booth with me and it was a night train. And, and silly me, I'm befriending these two men and I'm talking about Jesus in Italian and Pastor Dell's there, and, uh, but they become more than friendly, right? And Pastor Dell falls asleep and I'm shaking her and I can't figure out till this day why she, she could, wouldn't wake up. She did not wake up. And uh, these men, now I'm in this, this car with these two men, and now they were inappropriate. And I'm asking God, please, now I did say, please send me an angel. I asked him for an angel at the next stop. The next stop comes this six foot tall, I don't know how tall, he, he seemed way more than six foot. He plumps himself in the chair, in the seat, in our car, comes in and doesn't say one word. Not one word, and these two guys left. So th those are my uh, beautiful stories of uh, my testimonies of angels, and they're real, and I know they're real. Um, so maybe I'll have Sharon share at this point. Sharon, you can unmute, and, and if you want to put your video on, please, and you can share your story of the your angel story. Probably, I, I'm thinking probably 10 years. probably about 10 years ago, um, I was going to work and I normally take the um, the GO train into work. I used to work at York, or sorry, at uh, Queen and University. And I used to walk into work because I needed the exercise. And, uh, you know, when you get out of Union Station and uh, you're walking, and I used to walk up York Street to Queen Street and then go over to Queen and University. 
And you know, there's a lot of homeless people, like you're literally, they litter the ground because they sleep outside. And you just, you know what, at a certain point, you just get used to them. Um, I mean, you almost don't notice them, right? Because you're in the hustle and bustle of going backward and forward to work. Um, and then you'll see some who are talking to themselves and uh, this one morning and it was Remembrance Day. And uh, so Remembrance Day, you know, government employees, bank employees, they don't have to go into work. And uh, because there's normally a lot of people coming off the trains and in the, uh, the downtown financial area. Anyway, so I'm walking along and in front of me, there's a man and he is having a, con a very intense conversation with nobody. And I, you know, and I just, I, I mean, I didn't really think anything of it. And the, but in my mind, I thought to myself, there he goes having an imaginary conversation with his friend. This is what I thought in my mind, never said anything. As soon as I thought that, this person turned around and said to me, what did you say? And I'm just like, I'm looking around and I'm thinking like, this, can this guy read my mind? Like I would never, I never said anything. And then he became very menacing. And he stopped and he said, what did you say? And he's turning around. And now I'm, I'm a little bit afraid, but I'm thinking, ah, you know what? There should be, you know, there's normally cars around, police around, people around. I'm good. And I, it dawned on me, it's Remembrance Day. There's nobody. There's not a police on the street. There is nobody around. And I'm thinking, and this guy is menacing and now he's in my face. And uh, by this time, I was up by where the Sheridan Hotel is. And if anybody knows how on York Street, how that hotel is designed is that there's the uh, there's York Street and the sidewalk, and then there's a parking lot. And in order to get to the front, the entrance, where there's like normally a doorman, you got to run through the parking lot and uh, to get help. And so I'm there, and now I'm, I, I know I'm going to be, and I thought to myself, you know what? Today, I might be on the evening news and I'm thinking, can I, and I'm looking at this guy now and I'm sizing him up and I'm thinking, can I run fast enough? And I had two bags in my hand. So I like, I am thinking I got to drop my bags. Can I run fast enough to get to that front door? And I'm looking at, and this guy is like, he's kind of muscular and he's fit. And I'm thinking there's no way I can outrun him. And if he has a knife or he does like, I, and I'm thinking I'm done. And so I just decided, and you know what? I'm not even asking for the Lord to, to intervene at this point in time. I'm just thinking, what are my options? And I just thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to drop my bags and I'm going to get some punches in. Even if I end up in the hospital today, I am going to leave my mark. That's what my flesh is saying to me. And so as I'm about to drop my bags and like start punching, there was like, I think it was either two or three guys come around the corner at Queen and York. And immediately they don't even like, they literally came around the corner and just said to the guy, what are you doing? Get away from her right now. And I'm like, because normally when you're in that situation and like you're in a confrontation, like the, the society that we live in right now is people don't get involved, right? They will look on maybe, and maybe after you've been injured, they might get involved. But these guys, like, and like I said, they just came around the corner, spoke to the guy. And as soon as they spoke to him, he just like, he just left. He just, just went away, swearing, carrying on. And then I'm trying to now say to these guys, I didn't even do anything to this guy. I didn't even say, they did not even stop. They just said, they just kept walking. And I'm thinking like that, like that is the weirdest thing that, and I realized, you know what? Those were my angels. Because like I said, I think I would have been on the evening news that night, you know, being beat up. So that is my story of God's uh, great provision for me. And I, I think about it often and I think, wow, you know what? Yeah, those were definitely angels who came and rescued me that day because there was nobody, nobody to rescue me. And there's no way that I would have been able to take that guy on. Yeah, that that is for that was so real. And when Sharon shared that with me, I knew that that was definitely real. And thank you so much, Sharon, for coming this morning and for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. It's special. So, um, yeah, they're real. 
And whether they're humans or whether they're divine, they are ours. Matthew 18, 10 says, beware that you do not despise or feel scornful towards or think little of one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always are in the presence of and look upon the face of my father who is in heaven. So if you're being mean to somebody, if you hate someone, if you have unforgiveness towards someone, they have an angel <laughs> also. So beware that you do not step over the line over somebody else's um, human <laughs> because we cannot, we have, we are not allowed to do that. We are not allowed to, to be, um, to have that kind of, of, uh, of uh, interaction with humanity. We must love. If you're a Christian, you must love. Um, I think I'll, I'll go, we'll go straight into the last one. Um, this man is a, a, an author, a Canadian author, John Krieger, and he's going to share a few little clips from the book, The Angel Effect. Number three, Brother Bob. Coming to people of faith necessarily. I mean, you might think, oh, well, people that are, you know, Christian believe in angels and believe that this is God's presence. But you're saying that this, this happens across the board, people of faith and no faith. Well, that, that and they will attribute it when it does happen to a religious experience of some sort. Uh, it, it will be an angel. It will be Christ. It will be God. They're, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll assign a religious explanation to it. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing that interests me is that this also happens to people who are not at all religious, people who are uh, agnostic, outright atheists, people who have absolutely no belief uh, beyond, I guess, uh, the religion describe this experience. And, and they interpret it differently. They see it as not a religious experience or, or anything spiritual, but they see it as somehow something internal of their brain helping them during a critical moment reaching out or or you know some other they'll find another way of explaining the phenomenon yeah so so give us give us um some examples of some of these stories there's some kind of famous ones uh for instance last man out of the um of one of the towers during 9 11. yes so ron de francesco's work a money market trader working in the south tower of the world trade center um just going about his everyday routine um had of course after after the plane hit like many other people, found himself trapped above uh, the impact uh, zone in, in the tower. And Ron was was with others. Um, people were were actually um, being you know succumbing to the smoke in that stairwell. Um, he felt that he was trapped. They felt they were trapped. He sort of slumped down right above the impact zone. Um, and he 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 felt that perhaps his you know his life was over. That his fight was over. There's no way that he could get out. And he felt what he described as an angel inter intervene. He suddenly felt this presence and get up, you know, you, you can get out of this, you can survive this. And he actually felt that he was physically directed down into a place that people wouldn't normally want to go, and that is into the fire. So he fought his way through debris, through flames, and emerged on the other uh, end of this, uh, several floors of, of debris and flames, uh, in, a, in, a, in a normal stairwell. In a sense, it was lit, and it was it was uh, he was able to get get down and get out just as as the building collapsed. So so um, when I was working on the third man factor, his story really struck me because here was a guy who was just going to work, mm -hmm. and suddenly he found himself in this incredibly stressful, horrific, unbelievable situation, and he survived because of one of these experiences, an intervention by what he called an angel. Mm -hmm. And and then other people started contacting him, um, and, and they brought similar stories, you know, uh, great white. Thank you. I just wanted to hear you to hear that one little piece. And uh, yeah, there's all kinds of, of people who have had um, experiences and, and they do come in voices and, and angels can speak without showing themselves um, <clears throat> to you. And uh, and what's beautiful is sometimes like you should know the voice of the Lord. Now, I do want to, I don't want to dwell on it, but I do want to share one scripture about the angel of light that is um, not godly. Um, let me see. Yeah. Uh, in Matthew 25, 41 says, then he will say to those on his left, Lead me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. And it's got in, in brackets demons. So one of the things that you need to know is that you need to know the voice of God. And you're only going to know his voice and a divine voice 
is um, if you're in the word, because there are other voices. And I know there are stories out there on that also where um, there's a voice, like someone would say to me, well, you know, I'll say to them, you need to follow God's voice. And they said, well, what, how do I do that? Well, you need to know the word of God. You need to know the, the like, People who worship Satan, they know the supernatural realm. They know who they're listening to. They know their spirits. They know their guides. They know the language. Please don't use that language because I've heard different ones say once in a while, you know, the same language as, um, <clears throat> as uh, you know, those people who worship Satan. Excuse me. <clears throat> All of a sudden, I have a frog in my throat, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah so you need to know the voice of god you need to know the voice of an angel when you see a physical i've shared some things that are very clear you were in distress the lord um you know came and he sent help for you um i i i'm thinking of my zia immaculata um when i went to italy she shared a story where she was in this she was very distraught she she had a hard hard life and she was one who had broken all the rules in regards to doing things right in the little old towns and so she had to move to naples but she, she was she had married she had loved this one man who was married and um and she loved him and anyway long story short whether you know you understand it or not um this particular day that she was so distraught around the corner came a man all dressed in white she said he was from head to toe white um dressed white in in white and he said to her don't worry things are going to be okay something like that and so you know we don't understand everything all i know is god loves us and he wants the best for us and he wants to help us and so don't underestimate uh, this realm, but you need to know the voice, you need to know and understand how it is, and you need to not worship them. <laughs> you need to know where the power lies, and you need to appreciate that power. And, you know, I did a study on angels, I've got scriptures on, like, like, if you read the word of God, you'll see tons of angels in Daniel, tons in Matthew, Luke, revelation is full of angels as you i'm sure remember you know an angel brought this an angel brought that because they're serious there's serious times in humanity on earth on planet earth mankind will not be able to handle look at you know when things a disaster when there's a disaster is when uh, god sends his angels you know you see movies about angels and it's sort of true in a sort of a funny type of way in a in a human way but you have to understand they are real and whether it's a, a movie or not um they are real and uh and they come when you need them <clears throat>